Hi guys, we are back in New York, baby, and it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, over the top beautiful day. Here in the collapse of everything, where we have made it to May 1st, 2024, we are one third of the way through 2024, so uh, my... Uh, New summer begins at Bugs in a Jar Farm. But before I get back to work tomorrow, uh, guys, I have to share with you this. I, I honestly believe this is the single best, uh, the, the single best essay I have ever read on uh, the subject of hopium and optimism and the end times and all of that stuff here on medium.com never heard of this man i've been on medium.com for a year and a half and uh never heard of this fellow clem samson clem samson and actually this he wrote this essay on march 28th i don't know why it's just appearing today and it is titled, Scientist, We Are On the Road to Nowhere. All right, let's find out about this road to nowhere that we're on. <clears throat> Human beings haven't really dealt with the real ramifications of Charles Darwin's epic discovery of the laws of natural selection and on the origin of species. After 1859, when Darwin presented the theories to the world, there was no immediate convulsion. It took a while for the horrible truth to sink in, but I don't think it's any coincidence that communism emerged fairly soon after as a possible coping mechanism to this dire news. I mean, it was biological science after all, so it must have given people her, huh, it must have given people her, huh, her, huh, huh, hope that even if we are evolved from slugs, the fact that we have discovered this truth indicates that we humans should use science to design a more just society where, you know, each man according to his need, from each man according to his due, and so on. Darwin, you see, was the apotheosis of something called the Enlightenment, which began hundreds of years earlier when men started to, be to believe they should trust their reason more than religion to explain the universe. The United States actually was a product of Enlightenment thinking, the rights of man and so forth. The Enlightenment ended for good sometime in the 1930s when science made a horrifying discovery that there existed in nature the possibility of a nuclear chain reaction, a reaction that went on and on. This was termed a sustained nuclear chain reaction. This discovery was made in the lab in 1938 and explained theoretically by a woman named, I guess, L-I-S-C, is that Lisa Meitner and her nephew in Copenhagen in January of 1939. This discovery was understood by the most ruthless maniacs ever I mean the world leaders at the time, to mean that human beings could now build a bomb that, well, just went on and on and on destroying things. It would be called the atom bomb, and it would be built less than six years later. The exploding of the atom bomb in Japan in 1945 was officially the end of the Enlightenment because it was clear that our reason and intelligence were not wonderful things at all. In fact, 
they were the horrible things that allowed us to create the nightmare that is the nuclear bomb. These two things, Darwin's theory of natural selection and Lise Meitner's theoretical explanation of the nuclear chain reaction, in fact, signal the great downfall of the human race. We thought we were so great, but it turns out we're just uppity monkeys. Here is the biological evidence from Darwin. We thought science was so great, but it turns out we have summoned the demon. <clears throat> Here is the demon in plain mathematics, according to uh, Meitner. <clears throat> However, we don't act like a race undergoing a great downfall. Business is continuing as normal. Shops are open and cars are cruising around and you're reading this article on an amazing device built by Apple Computer, now mine's by HP, and technology seems benign and harmless. But it's not. It's just not. So what is post-enlightenment thinking? It is post-Hegelian. You know, Hegel was the one who came up with the theory that truth was unveiling itself through history. The thesis meets the antithesis and forms the synthesis, and this process repeats until we reach the end of history, the end of a world. Well, it's not really the end of history. It turns out it is the end of the Enlightenment. <clears throat> we can no longer kid ourselves that our brains are helping us to make society a great place and that everybody is being enlightened more and more by intelligence. In other words, we can no longer be optimistic. And he puts the word optimistic in quotes. Before the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution, society was profoundly pessimistic. At least Western society, which was dominated by the Christian view that we are all born into sin. Even the most optimistic person alive during the Dark Ages could not expect much from mammon, the Christian term for the worship of wealth and the things of this world. It was understood that we were living in a deeply corrupted state of being. Thanks a lot, Adam and Eve. Optimism was reserved for the afterlife up on the clouds with the harp and the bearded old man, etc. Then came the Enlightenment. The scientific method was actually invented by friars of the church, by the way, and all that pessimism was thrown out. With our intelligence, we could learn and understand and improve and finally be freed from that anxiety that Adam and Eve had dumped on us. In fact, we might be able to make paradise on Earth, a new Eden, thanks to science. Intelligence has been shown to cause anxiety, not enlightenment. People wonder why the kids are all so stressed and anxious, and they come up with theories about schools being too competitive and this and that. Nonsense. Young people are stressed and anxious because they have sensed these truths long before Clem Sampson wrote them in a stupid blog, but they have resisted them because they are afraid of them. Don't be afraid, kids. 
kids sense that their parents are majorly over-optimistic and that their parents are lying to them and their own brains are lying to them. And there is a malign conspiracy afoot to deny the truth that's as plain as the nose on their faces. That we are post-enlightenment people still speaking with an enlightenment language. In other words, we are all liars. So what is the true post-enlightenment language? It is first and foremost pessimistic. Optimism is nonsense. That belongs in the 19th century, not the 21st century. And yet, our age is characterized by what can only be described as a hysterical optimism. I don't mean hysterically funny. I mean panting, breathless, panicked optimism, hysteria, desperate resistance and rejection of the pessimism we know is the only authentic reaction to the catastrophe that is occurring around us and inside us every single day. We are cheerful phonies, desperately afraid of seeming uncheerful as there has been a worldwide cons conspiracy to keep things light, to avoid looking at the naked emperor, to sweep our animal nature and our extreme barbarous lust for violence under the carpet, to pretend we don't have a dark side, to repress and suppress the real, to live in a fantasy land, the happiest place on earth. No, I don't mean Disneyland. I mean our happy, fake personalities, our phoniness. And if we cannot do that effectively, then we must drug ourselves with antidepressants and drug our children with anti-anxiety medication until the last authentic smidge of pessimism is chemically squashed and we fit in again with the other phonies. So extreme skepticism is key. Skepticism is the ultimate toxic cleanse of all of your phoniness. Be skeptical of any and all enlightenment ideas that are hanging over from the dead last age. Yes, the enlightenment is over, but these habits of thinking that truth can be revealed and things can be improved and exciting revolutions are at hand that will lift mankind up to an even more enlightened status as the most noble being that ever existed. These habitual ways of perceiving the world are being clung to by the masses who are desperately afraid to let go of their delusions because we wrongly believe that they sustain us. They don't sustain us. They confuse us. Witness the gleeful embrace by wing nuts of conspiracy theories recently. Yes, even these wing nuts are exhibiting a holdover from enlightenment thinking. The, uh, the, uh, the hope that the real truth can be revealed. If we just dig around enough, we can find it, unearth it, bring it to light. People lack the requisite skepticism to doubt the unveiled truth. 
by conspiracy theorists, populist, YouTube professors, all kinds of pontificators and pundits don't listen to them. They are all speaking in the language of the past. The language of the future does not reveal truths. It yawns. What a bore, this outdated game of pretending we are something that we are not. The reaction of the post-enlightenment, authentic, real human being is not even to argue with the ghosts from the past or even roll our eyes. Our reaction is to put our hand to our mouth and yawn very deeply because we find these old songs to be extremely soporific and then they put us right to sleep. What if there is no truth to be revealed? What if there is no great awakening that history is leading us to? What if we are on the road to nowhere? People on the road to nowhere don't get excited about conspiracy theories or inflicting violence or electing a person who says he will make America great again. How'd that turn out? People on the road to nowhere are pessimistic of wild claims and even pessimistic about reasonable claims. People on the road to nowhere don't make claims. We spend less time in our reason and more time in our pajamas, resting and relaxing and exulting in our freedom, our freedom from pretending. When we meet one another, fellow travelers in the post-enlightenment walk of life, we smile gently at one another because it is such a relief to be in the presence of an other who does not pressure us to phony up, an other who, who, like us, has escaped the hysterical conspiracy of optimist. Such a relaxed space we share together whenever we are two post-enlightenment beings together. We create a church Wherever we gather in two or more than two, we create the sacred church of post-enlightenment liberation. Our prayer is our yawn. When we yawn together, a great magic happens, and wherever we are, the great light of freedom shines down upon us. Live free or yawn is our motto. Skepticism is our creed. But here's the thing. We are skeptical about skepticism too. That's the genius of skepticism, post-enlightenment. It doesn't take itself too seriously. It's just a tool to dislodge the scales from our eyes so that we may see for a moment the truth, the way it was revealed to us in 1859 by Darwin. Holy shit, I have hooves. Yes, in my moments of clarity, looking at myself in the full-length mirror, it has happened to me. My feet turn to hooves. I am revealed to be half man, half beast. It's okay. I'm liberated by this clarity, not horrified. Thank you, Darwin. I can handle the truth. Thank you, Ms. Meitner. You showed me the limits and nightmares of my head. In my head, in your head, in all of our heads since 1939, 
there has been living a nuclear chain reaction that is capable of destroying the entire world. Wow, what a bunch of hotheads. Get me out of my head. I will get you out of yours. That's our only job post-enlightenment to save each other's souls by reminding each other that our heads are deluded and that our hearts are full of sentimental shit. It is only our souls that are pure, pure as summer sun. Just don't stare at your pure soul too long. You'll go blind. We're only permitted glimpses. Wait, what about the optimistic takeaway and the gung-ho call to action? Hmm. <coughs> well, we must gather and break bread together, we true atheists. I don't use the term atheist here to mean we don't believe in God. The term atheist, the way I use it, means we don't believe in science either. We don't believe in belief. Belief is the oppressor. Beliefs are the chains. Believers are the enemies. And the believed is a lie. Repeat after me. Belief is the oppressor. Beliefs are the chains. Believers are the enemies, and the believed is a lie. No dogma, no teacher, no guru, no method. Freedom, God Almighty, freedom at last. Now, let's eat. <laughs> so, uh, I, I guess Clem Clemson... Uh, this was actually the third in a series, so I, I'm going to have to go back and catch up on scientist climate change is the least of our worries. Thank you, Clem. <clears throat> Rising sea levels and increased temperatures are nothing compared to this. I will have to read that one and then... Uh, he also has one scientist. We have some very bad news for you. You might want to sit down. And there you go. So who is Clem Sampson? Clem Sampson is a self-described essayist, humorist, satirist, funniest, poetist, fictionalist, fabulist, quizicist, journalist. He's a creating, creative writing professor at Harvard College in Duluth, Minnesota. And he has a new follower. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Clem Sampson, for the single best... Uh, <laughs> The single best essay I think I have ever uh, read on these goddamn hopium peddlers. Uh, good Lord, you go, Brother Clem. I can't wait to see his uh, his spin on these uh, these uh, climate, particularly these carbon alarmists. I I, I really am getting as sick of these carbon alarmists. Uh, as I am of carbon deniers. Uh, that they really are. Uh, these carbon alarmists uh, right here in the Doomosphere. Uh, I don't know. I, I do not think Elliot Jacobson is a carbon well, alarmist. We're all alarmists to a degree because we don't like what's happening. But Elliot reports on it. But Elliot reports on the SSTs, the GHGs. I, I, I have never, I have never asked. I, I need to ask Elliot flat out. He's not for ending. Uh, 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 what, which is the bigger problem? Is it the carbon Overshoot. in the economy, or is it the economy? The economy's the problem. The overshoots the problem, 
And if we didn't have overshoot, we wouldn't have all these problems, right? And industrialization and everything else. See there ya. you go. We're uh, fucked. All right, there you go. There you go. This There's is my 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 face. fellow uh, post enlightenment thinker. So we can uh, environmental coffee. We can get together and breathe a sigh of relief that yes. we can be in the company yes. of people with fucking brains. Yes. Uh, on this planet. So I honestly don't know if Clem considers himself to be a doomer. I need to write Clem and ask him if he is a doomer. All right, but uh, I got to wrap this up because I think I have a Zoom call coming in in a minute. Get out there and revel in your pessimistic freedom from the hopium peddlers while you still can. Bye, guys.